this is a uh, this is a very interesting time we're living in. Um, and as Amber articulated, there is, uh, I'm gonna say a, a sense of despair, but my perspective is uh, there's no need to despair. These are things that when in our training, we pretty much prepared for, we didn't see the level of the resistance being as high as it is, but again, it is it's a leadership position to which we are accustomed to operating. Um, I have received tons of, of emails and phone calls and uh, information to support the argument against the ruling of the courts. And as much as uh, it would be nice to engage in that kind of dialogue, that's really uh, what, what, not what this is about. So let's talk about some things that we can control. Like I said, I have heard the concerns from my field in the field of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in the face of the affirmative action ruling from the Supreme Court. And the easiest thing in the world for me to do in the face of that would be to say, uh, don't worry about it. It's going to be all right in the long run, uh, because it will. And I believe that. But my immediate thinking is for the practitioners in the field, um, what, is, what is going to be needed going forward? to sustain the progress that we made and the momentum that, that we were gaining. I want you all to also realize as resistance increases in what we're doing, there's a reason for it. You don't oppose or fight vehemently against something that is not a threat to the status quo, especially for the benefit for the masses. And that's what we're doing. So what do we possess that will allow us to see the strategy through? to deal with the resistance that is coming from the highest, uh, the highest office in the land, so to speak. We have clear thinking. We have to remove and reconcile our emotions and understand that what we are doing is not designed to be easy. What we are seeing is the height of the emotion that underlies diversity, equity, and inclusion work. I will say this, don't give in to it. Don't let your mind be hijacked by the heightened emotional state that is part of this conversation. I want you to engage in the thinking that is required to meet the challenge head on. So as DEI practitioners, what can we do? We have to understand that what's going on, we knew was coming. We have a conservative court. We have privileged perspectives. And then we have uninformed and, and, and uneducated people doing DEI work wrongly. What we need to do as a part of as DEI practitioners is to promote what we do, demonstrate the value in what we do, and articulate the value proposition that is endemic to the body of knowledge that supports diversity, equity, and inclusion. Simply put, we need people doing what we do who are certified to do the work. I will say this and I believe it wholeheartedly and that is certification is more important now than it has ever been. And the reason why you hear me start with that is because we have to stress that in order to do this thing right and to remove people who are just, in my, in my words, cashing checks and doing nothing, there has to be some way to govern what is standardized in order to give people what they think they're paying for. Part of our problem is people not knowing what real DEI practice looks like. Therefore, there's not much appreciation for what diversity, equity, and inclusion really is and how, to, and how it positively impacts the bottom line. Many times people will say, well, you know, especially if they are quote unquote, this is not to insult anybody who's in the uh, accounting world, but if you're a bean counter, people who are really driven by the bottom line will say, well, how does this directly impact the bottom line? If at that moment of opportunity, all you have is stutter and nothing to provide is impact or guidance, you're automatically discredited. Remember, you already don't want to be there. I want you to understand this resistance is part of the process. But the first time you can respond correctly and provide with just something simple. And in and, and the courses we teach, we teach you a, a mantra. You know, we're going <laughs> to support the bottom line, retain and, 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 and gain people in, into, the, into the field. 
So we're going to recruit, retain, and, and support organization, organizational goals. If you can do one of those three things or just say those three things, as soon as they respond to you, it gives you time to think and it gives them time to realize there is something to this. Real DEI practitioners have the language, they have the agility in thinking, they have a business case for DEI's existence. It's important to understand that if you cannot clearly articulate the business case for DEI, chances are you and or your position is living on borrowed time. The company will not appreciate the success that accompanies an effective DEI practitioner or its benefits. And they will get more of what they think they know of something that they said didn't have any value in the first place. A valued colleague mentioned to me in a conversation that part of our problem is there is uh, there are no barriers to doing what we do. And if you think about that, it, it's really compelling because it essentially says any person who wants to do what we do will be allowed to do what we do. If you're popular in your place of employment or you're good with people, you may be promoted to the level of a diversity practitioner. It may be an, an increase in money, which on the surface seems like a good idea, but when it comes time to really impacting that business, that place, that opportunity positively, that person who has not been trained in some formal way is gonna do a discredit to what we do and make it look like the whole work is not worth the time. So if you're in a position to make a difference, to have a voice, say something. You, you almost have to. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I, I saw you, I paused, I saw Tavis Smith. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lee. Uh, we now have Tavis on call, he's on vacation. Hi, Tavis. Good morning, How's it? good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, how's everybody doing? Good, good, good. Good to hear from you, Tavis. I was right in the middle of a flow when I saw you, your text came up, so I paused. <laughs> no, 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 no. You didn't you didn't need to you didn't need to pause. As a matter of fact, I was enjoying it. Why don't you go ahead and finish what you were saying? I was I was taking notes myself. I can I can chime in when you finish, but please finish. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> oh, okay. No worries. Okay. Um I just I was saying before, a, a value colleague was mentioning that anybody can come into this field and, and do what we do. And that is a problem. It, it may look like an opportunity to the person that's, that's allowed to act, but the problem is he, she, or they should not be in that position because they're gonna do us a disservice. We're in a time where mistakes has to be minimized. And the way you minimize mistakes and what we're doing, you have to be trained. And this can best be done through a well-versed, uh, I should say, well, best done by people who are well-versed in our profession and engaging in critical, critical conversations and then stepping up as DEI leaders. And I'm sure many of you have done the reading and some of you might have seen or, or might have read somewhere that there was um, a, an Asian support behind this initiative about affirmative action. When I meet those conversations, I like people to understand that something that we have that is in our, in our advantage, and that is the inclusive process that are part of DEI. We cannot get into blaming and shaming. So I say that to say this, DEI leaders don't blame and we don't shame. If we find out information that may be counted to what we do, we don't blame the person. We might blame the process and then talk about educating and redirecting the person. The one thing we don't want to do is get into a divisive argument where the gains that we have been making are going to be essentially subterfuge because we are no longer united. We talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion because we want all persons who are able to participate to be able to do just that and have the opportunity. And we're not talking about disadvantaging one to advantage another. Never been the case. Part of the reason for the affirmative action was the moral argument. We got that. We, I'm not saying that it's no longer needed, so don't get it twisted about what I'm about to say next. But we and our functioning as DEI practitioners are operating on top of affirmative action. We're not talking about the value proposition that each of us are able to contribute because we're better educated, because we can see the landmines and the trip-ups that are possible when we, when we don't think well. So the ruling, however it may be discouraging, is not the end of the story. Remember, it was narrowly focused. And I know people who are deep thinkers and, and who are very pragmatic, or I would say pragmatic, who are proactive in their thinking are saying, well, this is the beginning of a landslide of other things. My thing is, if you see what's coming, you don't have to 
fall prey to it. You prepare for it so you can deal with it. By not dividing it and, pre and avoiding the tendency to point a finger at someone or another ethnicity for, um, for a, a ruling such as this doesn't help us. One of the tenets of DEI is to understand that at some point, if not now soon, you're gonna be required to represent people who are not like you, people who have not historically acted in your or their own best interests. People who have been, um, I, I like to say, learning with me whenever I facilitate a class will hear me say that um, the easiest thing to do in the world is to blame somebody. The toughest thing in the world to do is to help somebody see where there's an, where there's an improvement opportunity. And that's what we do. When we meet these situations that we're dealing with now that's highly emotionally charged, you will hear me say, because the nature of what we do is emotional by base, uh, just by nature and its base, we have to meet that with pragmatism. In this case, because of how high it reaches, we have to meet it with what I call a pragmatic passion. So this is not to discount the passion that is a part of what we do and the emotion that is necessary to drive us and to gives us energy. It's saying we want to be very thinking about how we approach it. Don't be so reductionist to think that there's a simple approach to solving this, this problem, it's huge. As DEI practitioners, what can we do? We can fully understand that we are practitioners. I'm a person who pay attention to the words because the words give you clues in how to move next. If you don't pay attention, you become victimized by it. Think about this. There are fields of endeavor where most of us trust sometimes with our very life people in the fields that by their design are aspirational. To say that something is aspirational means that they're aspiring to do better. We have people who practice law. Think about that. People who practice medicine, right? People who pursue justice. In each of these cases, you know, we haven't discounted their profession, questioned their approaches, and we support their successes. What is left out of the conversation and thinking is that at some point, each of these endeavors, if you just do your history and go back, were questioned and doubted. Our situation is no different. The thing we have to do now is understand that just because we're being questioned, it's because there is some doubt. That doesn't mean we have to give into it. I like to, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an avid boxing fan. There was a person I used to like back in the day, if you do your uh, research. His name was Marvin Hagler. And he said something during an interview that uh, I remember. And he said, he was about to fight Tommen, the hitman Hearns. He was expected to lose. And if you follow fights, you know the outcome of that fight. When they interviewed Marvin Hagler, he said, when you feed the faith and starve the doubt, there is no doubt about your faith. So when he went into that situation where it looked like he was destined to lose because he believed wholeheartedly in his processes and himself, he overcame Tommy Hearns. We're in the same type of fight. We have to believe in what we're doing. And we at the Institute for Diversity Certification believe wholeheartedly in what we're doing and the training that we, that we provide to our practitioners. We believe we set you up for success by giving you practical and theoretical knowledge that will allow you to engage the conversation. And when it comes time to say something, you will have something to say and be able to articulate it well. I always say in my classroom, opportunity seldom comes at a time of your choosing. But when it is presented, you have to be able to say something. And you must speak. That's not the time to stutter, and it is the time to be prepared. Remain vigilant. Immerse yourself in the knowledge and the practices of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and become the quintessential professional that represents all people. You're gonna find in doing what we do is D and DEI, that many times we go, we go head to head and bump heads sometimes with the HR folks, because we are about people. We are fundamentally driven to support people. HR supports policies and the employer. When you are supporting people, especially the amount and the inclusive nature of what we're doing, you're gonna meet resistance because everybody does not want other people to be a part of the success strategy. They wanna keep it all for themselves. If you're in a position and you have a voice, 
ensure that the training that you're receiving is provided <clears throat> from people who are certified to provide that training. Certificates are good. They provide a foundation, but certification provides you with a body of knowledge, with a standardized process to ensure that you can act as a professional. As, as you would trust a CPA or an attorney or a physician or anything else, this field is no different. Ensure that you are provided with information that is beyond what you might find online or through the advent of chat GPT. I know many people think that's the end all be all, but if you read carefully, it tells you it's learning as we are. It is a learning system. What we do in the DEI space requires conversation from people who have lived experiences, who have learning and is willing to share it. And you're also with other professionals who will also share their perspectives. That will give you something that you can't get in any other way. I ask you all to stay the course. You're being provided with success strategies that are designed to work and do work. You see what's in front of you. Don't shrink before it, meet it head on. We'll be open to your questions, uh, I believe. If Tyvis is ready, I'm done. As we say around here, Dr. Lee, we stay ready, so we ain't got to get ready. So I, I, I'm right. always ready uh, to engage <laughs> in a conversation uh, about how to advance our people. And let me start. Uh, I'm only going to be on for a few minutes, but I wanted to start by saying thank you for your work and your witness. And uh, uh, I enjoyed immensely that presentation, uh, as I'm sure others did as well. So thank you for just uh, downloading us with information that we can use uh, to, to advance us in the struggle that, that we are in. And it is a struggle. Uh, I'm going to talk in a moment about a Washington Post piece uh, that is out today that I was interviewed for, and I'll tell you where you can find it and how to read it. Uh, but I close this conversation with the Washington Post today talking about affirmative action by saying the following, when we fight, we win. That's the story of our people. When we fight, we win. We're always, we are perennially engaged in a struggle for progress, for freedom, and for justice, and for fundamental fairness in this country. Always in that struggle, have been from day one and will be until, uh, until, uh, until eternity. We'll always be in a struggle for fundamental fairness and for, again, justice and freedom. But when we fight, we win. Uh, that is the story that, um, that resonates uh, with me today, and I hope will resonate with you, that when we fight, we win. Uh, I love Dr. Lee's um, invocation of, of the fight game. I am a pugilist myself. I, I love to box. I box as a workout. I have a great trainer in Los Angeles, and we talk boxing all the time, so I'm a boxing fan as well. And I love the story of Marvin Hagler and Tommy the Hitman Hearns. I also love the story of Muhammad Ali, who at one point in his career lost a major fight to Joe Frazier. Uh, and Joe Frazier put Ali on the canvas. I mean, I, Ali is the GOAT, the greatest of all time, but uh, Joe Frazier in Madison Square Garden uh, in New York City put Ali on the canvas, and nobody could believe, given how hard that hit was, that Ali got back up. And after the fight in the press conference with, with a face that had been beaten to smithereens, you know, blood everywhere, uh, eyes half closed, uh, they ask Ali how and why it is that he got up because nobody could believe that Ali got up. And Ali's, ample, Ali's answer uh, was rather simple but poignant. He said to the press assembled, I got up because the ground is no place for a champion. <laughs> the ground is no place for a champion. And that's what we are. At our best, we are champions. Think of all the things that we have championed over all the things that we have succeeded over, all the hurdles we have cleared uh, in our history. Uh, we are champions and the ground is no place for a champion. And so many people think we got knocked down or got knocked out a week ago when this decision came, but I repeat, the ground is no place for a champion. So I, I wanna again, thank Dr. Lee for that fine presentation, uh, for his work and witness. I certainly wanna thank um, uh, Derwin and Leah and Amber, uh, I take great pride in the fact, so forgive me just for a moment, I take great pride in the fact that Derwin is my brother uh, and that Leah is my sister-in-law and that Amber is my niece. Uh, that means a lot to me to be a part of a family um, who is dedicated to doing its part um, to elevate our people. Uh, and the Society for Diversity is the foremost organization in this country of its kind. 
And I'm just humbled uh, that I'm a part of the family that Durbin and Leah and Amber are a part of. So I celebrate them uh, in what they're doing. Uh, let, me, let me hasten right quick just to make a few points. I mentioned this Washington Post column. Um, there's a young man named Ruben Navarrete Jr. Uh, you can probably tell by his last name. He's Latino, Harvard educated. So he went to Harvard. Um, Ruben and I were the first black and brown team in the country to host a radio show together many years ago. And we remain friends over these years. Uh, Ruben is a, a, is a conservative Latino. I am obviously an unapologetically progressive African-American. We don't agree on, on everything, but we're dear friends and brothers. And we've been friends for 30 years since we did this radio show together, making history once again. It's the first black and brown radio team in the country a couple of decades ago. And I've gone on to do the work that I do. And Ruben has gone on to be a great writer. He is the most widely read Latino columnist in the nation. Number one, um, there is no Latino columnist at any paper anywhere in the country that is read by more people than Ruben. He is syndicated by the Washington Post. He called me a couple of days ago and asked me to talk to him about affirmative action. And this column, which you can now read all of our, on all of our socials, just go to anything that says KBLA 1580. Go to any of our socials for KBLA 1580. It's up right now. Or you can go to my personal Twitter, uh, at Tavis Smiley, uh, my personal Twitter, Instagram, all of my pages. So any of my personal stuff, you can find it uh, at the real Tavis Smiley or KBLA 1580. The column is up right now. They just posted it, just came out this morning. But you'll read a dynamic conversation between the two of us, uh, conservative, progressive, brown, black, um, having our say, disagreeing about this issue. Um, but in the end, as I said, the thing that Ruben closes the column admitting is that Tavis and I do agree on this. When we fight, we win. I raise that because I want you to read the story so you can, beyond this conversation, understand better how I see this issue. I don't have too much time to get into all that now, but this column will give you a better insight um, and you can read it and share it with others, I think, about why uh, we are fighting um, in this moment, uh, even though they've rendered affirmative action, uh, they've gutted it uh, in, in education. So, so, so check out the column. Uh, but Ruben agreed in the end um, with me that, again, when we fight, we win. And so that's what we're here to talk about, how we, uh, how we fight and, and, and how we win. Um, let me pivot right quick and say that yesterday I was honored to, to speak in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, yes, that Gettysburg, the place of the bloodiest battle in the Civil War, Gettysburg, the place of Lincoln's speech, uh, the Gettysburg Address. Uh, four score and seven years ago. Many of you learned that in, in, in school. Um, but I was, for the first time ever, in Gettysburg yesterday, invited to give a major talk there yesterday. And just being in Gettysburg, the site again of the bloodiest battle in the Civil War, fight, of course, over the issue of, of slavery, um, Lincoln fighting to save the Union. Um, being in Gettysburg yesterday, and again, if you go to our socials at KBLA 1580 or my personal socials, you'll see a bunch of pictures that I took as I moved around that city, and it was stunning for me to see bullet holes. They preserved the city quite nicely, bullet holes in the walls from gunshots that were fired during the Civil War. Some of the cannons that were used in that uh, battle are still there. Uh, it's a relic in many ways, um, but when you go there, you can see what happened all those years ago in this bloodiest battle during the Civil War. And I was reminded yesterday on a number of fronts of how far we have come in this country since the Civil War and how far we have yet to go. And I might surprise you by saying the following, but it is true, uh, the Civil War ain't over yet. Civil War in this country is not yet over. Lincoln had a choice between a free union and uh, slavery destroying this country. Free union or slavery. We have a choice today democracy for all or white supremacist uh, leadership in this country. Democracy for all or white supremacy. That's the choice. And so in many places, in many ways, the, the, the Civil War is not yet over. We're still fighting. Um, why do I raise that? Uh, because this war has gone on for so long and the numbers are starting to shift. We all know that it's just a matter of time before, for the first time ever, this country will be a majority minority nation. People of color combined will outnumber others for the first time. And folk are having a hard time talking about it, processing it, 
and dealing with it. That's why you see on Fox News all this talk about the great replacement theory and all the nonsense. You see the the, 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 the stupidity that comes out of the mouth of Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump and others. And I don't mean to be political. I'm just trying to tell you what the facts are. There's a fight going on. And in many respects, the civil war in this country is not yet over. The question is, who are we really? What kind of country are we really going to be? America has grown older, but we've not grown wiser. Now, ultimately, it's a question of who we are. Not who we say we are, not the ideals, the I-D-E-A-L-S that we profess, but the I-D-E-A-S, the, I- the ideas, the crazy ideas that are being advanced right now. The ideas don't match the ideals that we profess as Americans. And so we're in a fight. And what do you do uh, when the numbers are changing? Uh, what do you do when the game is changing? Um, you change the rules. <laughs> they, they can't change the game, but they change the rules. And so all of these decisions that you see being made now about banning books, doing away with affirmative action, closing the borders, I could do this all day long, the fight against reparations, all of this is because they can't change the game. And so they decided to change the rules. Uh, And that's why we find ourselves in this fight against affirmative action. Dr. Lee said moments ago, he was correct. We knew this was coming. It was the worst kept secret in all of Washington. Everybody knew this 63 court was Mm -hmm. going to end affirmative action. Uh, The real problem is this, Dr. Lee, as you well know, it ain't over. Not only is the civil war not over in this country, the fight against affirmative action is not over because this guts affirmative action in education. Mark my word, it's just a matter of time before they find another case they're going to hear on affirmative action in employment, affirmative action in contracting. It's just a matter of time. I remind people all the time that the Supreme Court chooses the cases it wants to hear. Underline that. They choose the cases they want to hear. And so they're, they're, they're going to choose another a couple of cases that will allow them to address the issue of affirmative action in education, uh, in, in, uh, in employment. Uh, and in contract. So this is not over. Um, and I just want to echo uh, what, uh, what, Dr., what Dr. Lee said moments ago. And I, I think the best way I can do that is to share with you um, the words of Dr. King. Uh, because I always find, and I'll close on this note, I always find in moments like these, Dr. Lee and all those assembled, I'm honored to be talking to all of you across the country. Uh, I always find myself in moments of controversy and challenge going back uh, to King. I regard King, as many of you know, as the greatest American this country has ever produced. That's my assessment, the greatest American we've ever produced. And in moments like these, because King and Malcolm and our other ancestors were so prophetic, whenever I find myself in a conundrum, I'm asking myself not just what would Jesus do, but what would Martin say? What would Malcolm say? What would our ancestors say? It's always find solace in turning back to our ancestors. Uh, and there are two or three things that, that King said that I think uh, will underscore uh, what Dr. Lee said moments ago, and I want to be simpatico with him. Um, Dr. King put it this way, and this is our challenge in this moment. I couldn't have said it better than Dr. Lee, so I'm going to rely on Dr. King. King said, if it falls your lot in life to be a street sweeper, then you sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. You sweep the streets like Beethoven composed music. You sweep those streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. If it falls your lot in life to be just a street sweeper, you sweep those streets so well that when you die, all the host of heaven will pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper. Then King went on to say the following, that each of us should do our work our witness so well that the dead, the living, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. I mean, think about that. That's a tall order. To do our work in DE&I every day, to do it so well that the dead, the living, or the unborn couldn't do it any better. I suggest to you that the eyes of the future are looking back at us right now. Black babies yet unborn, the eyes of the future are looking back at us right now and hoping and praying that we get this moment right, that we do not surrender, that we continue to fight the good fight to keep the faith and to finish the course. That's what this is about. 
Um, we never let misery have the last word. You know how many times we've been counted out in our fight for freedom and justice and fundamental fairness? Think of all the times we've been counted out, and yet we are here. Uh, my friend Cornel West says all the time, makes me laugh, that when white folks see us walk into the room, they ought to just give us a standing ovation. <laughs> they ought to just give Negroes a standing ovation. Uh, but you consider all that we've endured and that we are still here and at our best uh, we are the conscience of this country. And that's what you have to be right now as practitioners and professionals. You have to be the conscience of the country. Clearly, the Supreme Court is not the conscience of this country. They keep rendering decisions every other day, it seems, um, that are an anathema uh, to the rest of the country. So they are clearly not the conscience of this country. But black folk at our best have always been just that. So I close again with the words of my friend, uh, my hero, Dr. King. Power, this ask, is it safe? Expediency, ask, is it politic? Vanity, ask, is it popular? But conscience, ask, is it right? And every now and then, good people, we must take positions that are neither comfortable, safe, but polit politically correct or convenient. Do it because our conscience tells us that it is right. Continuing to fight, continuing to do our best work, continuing to uh, advance the causes that will matter to generations of black folk who are not even born yet. That's our calling in this moment. They're gonna look back on this moment in history. Here's the question. They're gonna look back on this moment. The historians will look back on this moment as they've done many other moments and say, what did these black people do? What did these Negroes do when they were counted out again? When the Supreme Court ruled unconstitutional, any corrective program to just usher them into the room, to give them an opportunity. Jackie Robinson wasn't the first Negro who could play baseball with the white boys. He was the first one who had the opportunity to play baseball with the white boys. So it's all about opportunity. But history will look back on this moment and ask, what did we do in this moment? Uh, as my friend Jesse Jackson would say, to keep hope alive. I close for real, for real on this point. I said this many times, I said this in Gettysburg yesterday in my talk, optimism and hope are not the same thing. Optimism suggests there's a particular set of facts, circumstances, or conditions. Optimism says there's something you can see, feel, or touch that gives you reason to believe that things are going to get better and we are not in that moment. As we look around, there's no reason to be necessarily optimistic, but a hope is a very different thing. As black people, that's where we live. We live on Hope Boulevard. Our entire lives in this country have been built on nothing but a hope. And that's why the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There is no people like us who have continued to move ahead when there was no evidence to suggest that we could win. But I repeat and I close on this. We know that when we fight, we win. So the struggle continues, and I'm confident uh, that history will look back on this moment and, 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 and write and consider that Black folk once again stepped up to the challenge. Uh, they didn't take a beat down. Uh, they got up off the ground because the ground is no place for champions. Dr. Lee, thank you. Derwin, Leah, Amber, love you all. Thank you for the opportunity uh, to share with uh, this great audience today. I appreciate you all. Love you all. Thank you, Travis. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we're gonna hear from Katrina. Go ahead, Katrina. She's um, muted. Yeah. Maybe she can unmute, or is it you? She should be able to unmute. Hello, this is Katrina Jackson, and this has been so powerful this last 30 minutes. Um, I didn't really have a, a formal comment other than to say thank you for the space. Thank you for the reminder um, that we have to keep at it. And particularly the comments around, we can't afford to kind of practice at this, but we have to study our trade. We have to be skilled because, you know, that moment of not being prepared can really cost us to lose, you know, the war or lose the battle that we're in. So that was really powerful to me. And it just made me think I got to continue um, to read, continue to stay aware of what's happening and don't take it for granted and the work that I do every day. So thank you for this space and thank you for this session. Let me add to what Katrina said. 
And here's the thing we like to say in, in our training, Katrina, is that what we do, we're hitting a moving target constantly. We're learning more and more about people who have been otherwise marginalized or not considered or even removed from opportunities to participate. As we learn more, we add to our knowledge base and we share knowledge because it's through the sharing of that knowledge that we all are gonna come up. I was talking to the CEO and both he and I are in the D9. I'm, I'm the Omega Sci-Fi Return Incorporated. He's gonna beat me up about that, but I had to put it out there. Whatever, don't hate, it's one of them things. I'm just saying. We build bridges and the bridges that we build are not for us. That's what we need to understand. The work we put in, the suffering, the, the blows we're gonna hit, we're gonna take are not for us, but to make the people to come behind us have access and maybe be a little easier for them. That's what it's all about. That's why we can't quit. The work we started, it's not done yet. I'm seeing the love from you, you know, you know the deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Would anyone else like to um, come off mute and share and see if we have anything in the chat? Okay. From Shauna, part of being prepared is staying ahead of the game as much as possible. As hard as I try, sometimes I feel like playing catch up and doing, playing catch up and doing hot takes. What comes up in the news? Do you have any suggestions for staying ahead of the game? Well, the thing about it is, the, um, as I said before, because we're hitting a moving target and we are finding out more and more, not only about how we can do what we do better, but finding out also about the ploys that are being used against us. All we can do is, is my thing is um, create those conversations to communicate. I always say, put yourself in a room with somebody in there smarter differently than you. I don't say smarter than you, but smarter differently than you so that you can add to your knowledge base and then ask questions and, and then deliberately place you in those spaces where you're gonna find people willing to engage you in conversations. It might not always be to agree with you. It's the perspectives that are needed. And then you're having the thick skin enough to deal with what comes at you and not get, I like to say, uh, you know, emotionally involved in a conversation where you should be more pragmatic in the acceptance of new knowledge. And I'm, I'm gonna jump in here, even though I'm on vacation, um, one of the things that I want to make it so that we emphasize is we know what's coming down the road, right? So we knew that this affirmative action ruling was coming in about a year ago. Um, you noticed that we started pushing intentionally to make it so that affirmative action was considered to be different than DEI. Right. And we know that employment and contracting are next. So what do we need to do? We need to strategize. And this is the, the time when we come together, we sit down and we plan. We not only advocate for um, making sure that you have a plan for measurement purposes, we want you to have a plan so that you can avoid these pitfalls. Right. We know that this is coming. And one of the things that you said is that we DI leaders, we tend to act from behind and not ahead. And this is the time for us to put together our strategy so that we can get ahead and make it so that we stay ahead. Just like when we talk about generations and making it so that we're not looking at generations reactively everything that we need to do has to be proactive, meaning that there are certain things we can do. We know that uh, employment and contracting are next. We know that there's lawsuits just waiting to happen. So what we have to do is make it so that we're not the lawsuit, right? That means that we're going to have to be uh, individuals that, that pre-think just like how we make measurement into a forethought, we want to pre-think where are their pitfalls? This is where the skill comes in, right? And this is where we have to be strategic and making it so that we make our work legally defensible because it's going to be the company that doesn't know what they're doing and doesn't have skilled leaders that winds up getting to that Supreme Court case. And this is where we have to be proactive right? Because again, the more that we can make our work legally defensible, the better. How do you make it legally defensible? Number one, you got to use that business case. 
Number two, you have to be able, and, and there were a whole bunch of folks that were saying, oh, Leah, we don't need the business case. The business case is not relevant. Okay, you try, try, <laughs> try, try doing that affirmative action stuff now, okay? You got to have that business case. You got to make it so that what you're doing is relevant to the business, because if it's relevant to the business, then there's no way that anyone can untangle it, right? The second thing is we have to go beyond the business case and really talk about what's good for the future. And this is where we're not only talking about the right thing to do, but doing this because it is the sustainable thing to do, right? So we also, we, we need to talk about the right thing to do, but it's sustainable for us to make it so that we're talking about the future. And then number three, we need to make sure that we are working together with others um, and that we're equipping our senior leaders with the talking point to be able to stand up and say something. So with all these state laws that are going on and these uh, attacks on different organizations for being woke and so on, we don't have enough leaders standing up. We don't have enough. We don't have enough. It's not that people are not valuing DEI, but if they're going to be the only one standing up and saying something, yeah, they're going to be afraid for their job. They're going to be afraid of what's going to happen. The more that we can equip individuals who look like us and who don't look like us to stand up and say, hey, you know what? Here's Here's what, even if they have to read from the script, here's what we believe as an organization. We can have more power in the masses, but we got to get people to stand up. We got to get people to get comfortable talking about this. I'm, I'm seeing several questions. Yeah, Amber. I I wanted to allow um, Chantel to go ahead and come on and speak. And then we have um, Gregory and of Avonia, I'm gonna bring them over as panelists and then I'm gonna go through the, the all the questions that are in the chat because they're building up. I know it's a lot of questions. So go ahead, Chantel. Yeah, thank you so much, Amber. Really appreciate it. Hey, Dr. Lee, good to see you again. You are our um, presenter in my cohort. Uh, Indeed, so really good to see you. Yeah, yeah, Leah, thank you so much. I always love to hear your voice as well. And Shante, thank you so much for the operational question I had yesterday. Really appreciate it. Um, and Leah, you actually answered my question that I had because the question that I had is, you know, what steps can, you know, we as DEI practitioners um, within our organizations take to mitigate any negative consequences to the SCOTUS decision? Um, one of the things that we, um, I represent Humana and I see some of my colleagues here as well. And um, one of the things that we're talking about is a mitigation plan. Um, putting together a mitigation plan and, and Leah, to your point, providing those speaking points, talking points to our executive leadership, because we are the subject matter experts who know the content and can and, and can lead the folks to water, right? Um, <clears throat> what I what I would you know encourage you know everyone on the call, and one of the things that we talked about is because we are the subject matter experts, um, we we shouldn't be in a position to allow someone who is not the SME to write the narrative for DEI. So I, I would I would love you know any more you know tactical approaches strategic approaches that you all might might think might be helpful. Okay, and Chantel, I am I'm in town, so I'm right around the corner from you. Uh, so maybe we can get the get together Absolutely. and go to lunch to, yeah. on like. I saw your note can, to Carolyn. Yeah, we have yeah to yeah we yeah. can get together and do lunch with you. I can get together with your team on like Monday or Tuesday and do lunch, and um, we can just do a a one on one show, like not a one on one, but we can do like a group strategy planning session. So I'll sit down with everyone. I'll send you all some times when my daughter's not playing. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right, Gregory. Okay, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. I, uh, I have to say this is what has been the most incredibly motivating session for me to listen to in quite some time. And I thank all of you for inviting us as well as your distinguished speakers. I think Dr. Lee, amongst the things that you pointed out was that there are so many people who jumped into this space during the summer of 2020 that really didn't know what they were doing. And, and in our industry, the tourism industry, there was a lot of recovery money that was thrown around 
and organizations that never had $200,000 or $500,000 to spend on DEI consulting were making it quite easy for just about anybody, credential, yeah. non-credential, yeah. preferably if they were of color to come out and speak. And we've certainly seen that there's a pullback on those dollars nowadays. But I think amongst the things that's really a big concern for me is that there still remains a lot of individuals who are approaching this from an opportunist perspective, consulting groups that have done like management training and so forth, and now add the specialized piece of DEI, which is not specialized at all. And there still is a great deal of how do I um, find a way to monetize this work and not really make a difference in an organization. And to that degree, I constantly emphasize the need for credentialing so that those who are really naive about this to understand it. You know, I was on a call with a CEO the other day and he didn't know about it. And on top of it, his question was, can white people get credentialed? And I was floored that the thought of being credentialed seems to be something that only people of color would get. So from my perspective, I would really like us to really step up our efforts to separate those who really know this and those who don't. Because as we start to do that, I think, yes, Leah, we can get into these more media conversations around the narrative of the business case. Because aside from me saying that, you know, DEI is about, you know, business strategy and emphasizing the fact that we have to be able to talk about this from how this really contributes to the success of business. And then realizing that individuals who are engaging in these conversations should be able to see the bigger picture, not just these short runs and not trying to do sessions about unconscious bias and, and all of those things. And you're so spot on about looking down the road beyond this, because there is clearly a plan that if we're not proactive today, we'll be on the on the receiving end of it. Uh, last thing I'll end on is Leah knows we're planning a DEI conference in Philadelphia, and I have not seen such incredible interest in more of the meatier subjects. And the two that people have asked us about over and over again is, is there going to be a session on supplier diversity and is there going to be a session on credentialing? So I just kind of end on it saying that I think we definitely need to look at what is the campaigning to promote the difference so that those who don't know anything about this have a better sense of it and can make better selections of the people who are supposedly experts consulting with them. You hit so many, so many salient points, Gregory, that needs to be um, voiced on a, on, a, on a broader platform. <clears throat> One thing I want, I want to piggyback on, I had a conversation today and we're in a hour of a meeting, and I believe there are more people than you know who believe that a white person should not lead a DEI initiative. And it is antithetical to the very thing that we promote. If we're really talking about being inclusive, how can you exclude anybody? It's, it's counterintuitive. I mean, my thing is this, the, the thing that, the reason why affirmative action, in my opinion, and this is, you're welcome to beat me up if you want to, played itself was that it was introduced the wrong way. It came in from a blaming and shaming to where people who were a part of the problem were never included to, uh, as part of the solution. And it is impossible to get to a reasonable conclusion while having all the information. It's impossible to get to all the information if people who, are, who are, should be there are not a part of the conversation. So the other thing that we like to promote in the IDC is that we're not afraid of a real conversation. PC can't interfere with people, with people saying what's on their mind. If we're really sincere about what we're doing and educated in that respect, we should be open to whatever comes out and ready to deal with it. That's how it works. You let everybody speak and then be ready to say something when it is your time. If nothing else, you understand more fully and more clearly who you're dealing with in your environment. By people not being able to say what's on their mind, you never can get to the root of real solutions. It's impossible. Thank you. Okay, a question from Pamela. On LinkedIn yesterday, there was a post regarding four black women leaders that were stepping down from four major companies from their chief DEI roles. Not sure why they chose to move on or not, or if it was an impact from the South Carolina ruling. How do we strategize to keep or sustain the roles where we can continue to have impact? The fight has always been there, just more heightened now. Before, before even making an assessment on why a person uh, steps down from a position, it is imperative to find out the rest of the story. Now, what I would say is let's look at the person's credentials. Let's look at the business case that they presented for being there. 
because if there was not a business case for those people being there, if there was not a value proposition attached to what they were doing, save money, make money, satisfy organizational goals, the simple things, then to be quite honest, I don't know what these people were doing. I don't know if they were just cashing checks like other people who are performative in our field. What we have to look at is every case individually and then base our assessments on those cases. So to speculate about why people step down would not be in our best interest. What is in our best interest is to find out as much as we can about those people and then those companies and then have something to say smartly. T. Renee Smith, how do you handle the conversation from corporate business unit managers pushing back about supplier diversity or minority setbacks based on the affirmative action, affirmative action ruling? Uh, can you read that again? I was reading something about North Carolina because I'm here in North Carolina, so I missed the question. How do you handle the conversation from corporate business unit managers pushing back about supplier diversity or, oh. min or minor minority set asides based on the affirmative action group? Okay. I thought Leo would jump in. Okay, supplier diversity. Again, this is where being informed is, is so, so, so important. The reason for, for uh, supply diversity is, is, is a business imperative and advantage for the, for the company, for the corporation, for the institution. What has to be borne out is the advantages of cost avoidance for diversifying your, your supply diversity program that may be missing from people who have been depending upon the same source for who knows how long. What tends to happen when once vendors become comfortable with a, with a uh, business relationship is that the people who are at the highest rungs become disconnected from what, from what money is really being paid and the opportunities that may present themselves from people who have not been considered before. Now, when you talk about bringing in a, a supplier diversity uh, program or supplier diversity, or supplier diversity a, a diverse supplier who's different from what uh, has already been there, is make sure you vet those people through third party certifications, making sure that when they are tapped, when they are called upon, they can provide the excellence that was already there, such that there will not be an argument that accepting a diverse perspective is less than when we're promoting excellence in everything that we do. Because there is a mindset that difference is somehow less. And from that perspective alone, it tells you that people who are talking about diversity are not talking about it from, from the perspective of being a value. They're talking about from the perspective of it being a problem. So there's a lot of conversation that has to go into that. There's some more research that has to be done to support the persons who are being considered for the supplier diversity opportunity, such that when they are presented, you have options for the people who are there and they have been properly vetted to ensure that they too, that they too are not a part of the money grab that seems to be a part of this whole DEI initiative. Right. It's 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 uh I'm just gonna jump in here about this money grab thing. Um it is unfortunate that. Uh, you know, we have so many people that are in this space who, you know, they they basically are here for the money. And, and there has been a lot of money put into this industry um, over the last couple of years, especially after George Floyd died. However, um, what we're seeing now, I believe, is just a shakeout in the industry, right, where those people who are uh, really serious about getting this work are going to are going to be the ones who get it done, right? So um, we're we have to be very you know we we can't be discouraged if people walk away because you know some are walking away. Um, I know Vernay Meyer she she's leaving Netflix to go back to her own practice where she believes she would be able to have more impact and she will um, just as she had impact prior to. Uh, Netflix, but certainly some other companies, you know, they, they put money out there. They, um, uh, they, they were not that committed. And certainly um, now many are, are getting rid of their diversity people because again, they were just putting money out there and they weren't really committed to it. Um, even in terms of you know, some of the, the different individuals who are, you know, doing this work as consultants or as a job, they don't want to take the risk. They don't want to do the things that are going to um, make them stand out. They're not going to go against the grain because, you know, they don't want to lose their job. And at the end of the day, 
um, what's going to make you a valuable asset is you being able to take the kind of risk um, and, and to say the things that need to be said. Not And it's not necessarily what you're saying as much as how you're saying it. So let's not, um, let's not be confused about not saying something um, because that is not what we should be doing. We have to speak up. It's just how we speak up, right? And um, that's, again, where we have to be strategic about what we're saying and how we speak up and all those different things. There's people who we can partner with that can serve as allies. And we can work through those allies if we need to. Um, or if you have, um, you know, you're feeling kind of courageous, you can say the things that need to be said. Um, but again, just being mindful that we're in an environment where, you know, because there was so much money put out in this industry, there are folks who are like, hey, let's save some money. Let's let's do this. Let's do that. But I can tell you um, from a risk management perspective, those organizations are going to get into problems. Um, and, and it's up to you to talk about those things. Hey, you know, risk management says, you know, we we are setting ourselves up for problems. We know what kind of environment this is, right? We know that, um, you know, there's some folks who are thinking, I could do anything. Affirmative action is dead. No, it doesn't mean that titles, you know, title, title seven of the Civil Rights Act is dead. That's not dead. There are federal laws that you still have to abide by, right? And um, certainly we want to make it known that, um, you know, for the people who may not be committed to this industry, to this field, it's okay. We're still going to get it done. The next question that we have, um, are there any lessons learned that have been compi compiled regarding DEI in states that had outlawed affirmative action prior to the recent Supreme Court decision? I'm sure there has been, but I have not uh, aggregated any kind of data on those states. Mm -hmm. there, were, there, there were nine states that outlawed affirmative action before the ruling even came down. What, what has been identified in those states is that there has been a precipitative drop off in the participation of people of color who are already, uh, who are otherwise marginalized. That's, that was the, the concern about the, the ruling in the first place. But in those states like Arizona, Idaho, a few other states on West, um, is the reason why I say in the presence of what came down from the Supreme Court, it requires us to be better thinking and more proactive because we see what can come next. It all would, you know, I like to say things start small, but you have an opportunity while they're small to deal with. If you wait till they grow to acknowledge that it's a problem, then it's almost impossible to stop. So, so our, our perspective is to get it while it's small, get it while it's just starting. Another question, what are the immediate action strategies that need to be taken as DEI leader? The first things I would say as a DEI leader, depending upon where you are, is look at your policy and look at your affirmative action plans. Many of these things that are written already have not been really reviewed and have not been, um, I'm going to say, scrutinized. They've been accepted. And many times, the first time you, uh, you know, people in some companies meet resistance, they, they drop their focus. Look at what you have already in place and engage the conversation now. See, a lot of these places, you might find policies that haven't been addressed since the 80s. And a lot of them, the language that is used has to be very, very, very carefully scrutinized. And I said, I emphasize the very, very, because uh, another thing that I do, I always say, uh, the, uh, what's his name? Alansky, uh, Saul Alansky was the person who said, he who can change, uh, controls the language controls the masses. And since we are reading less and less and understanding and paying less attention to the words that are used in our discussions, we find ourselves disadvantaged by things that are right in plain view. Look at your policies, look at your plans, make sure that they are inclusive in their language, read them, question them. As I said before, what we do, the nature of what we do concerns people. The, the people who wrote those plans and, and procedures and policies were concerned about the employer, not the employees. That's where we come in. Um, another question, are you aware that North Carolina has on the floor to remove all DER roles from state positions? 
it's already started. I had a conversation with her leadership here. And I was telling them about a conversation I had with an individual who was a VP at a college here. And uh, her, her title was the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And she could not use any of the words in the description of her job or the performance of her duties. And just the conversation alone when she spoke to me made her realize how nonsensical it was. Again, this is a perfect example of how you control the language and you control the narrative and ultimately you control what is and is not going to be there next week, next year, two years from now. She, who was trained outside of us, I won't name the place, the place where she was trained, did not understand how to articulate the value proposition of doing what we do. She's a, she's a black woman who's put in a position for the optics. That's a problem. Leah, is there is there a webinar that IDC will provide? Will be providing lessons on how to speak up to ensure the message is going to be heard, especially when we are in leadership executive roles. I'm a CEO of a nonprofit. I already answered that. I said Amber is going to be. <laughs> I'll call Dr. Lee Amber. <laughs> I see that now. Okay, let me see. I'm trying to make sure I get everybody's question. Yes. Well, okay, okay. let me add, just speak on, on that right now, just to, you know, um, to address it in the immediacy, although not to the depth that's required. Um, I have, uh, I tend to be the, the quintessential optimist in that I approach a situation from the perspective that the people in the position of leadership want their businesses to succeed. I think because what we provide is a business strategic imperative that is designed for sustainability, especially consider the demographic of people who are coming into the workplace with Generation Z and the, and the, uh, and the alphas who are coming behind them, who, who are born in a place that is very diverse who, and who people that they call their friends and their besties look like everybody. So the, the question becomes, are the leadership being informed and I mean truly informed and given the language to hold the people who are their subordinated by position accountable for what needs to happen and the behavioral changes necessary to create an inclusive environment. What you will find if you get a chance to speak directly to leadership is many times they're oblivious. So you give them a, an opportunity to correct by informing. Once the leadership is informed, that is an accountability component that can be exercised. But before that happens, you cannot accuse anybody. So you have everyone the opportunity, first by education, then through accountability. I believe, let me see. Adrian Taylor, um, would you like to come off? I think you had your hand raised. Did you have a? No? I did not have my hand raised. I No, okay. I appreciate all of this feedback though. This has been wonderful. And thank you, Dr. Lee, for everything. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Okay, I think it was the volume. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Okay. The Aviana Richards. The yes. Hi. Yes. This is this is Ivania. Thank you so much for for actually hosting this uh, webinar today. It's been so very valuable. I just want to say that I, I cannot reiterate enough, and I've heard it so many times here today about the importance of having the business case. And um, I was uh, promoted into my uh, position as a, a uh, chief diversity officer in 2021. And I remember from going through the coursework, uh, don't stand on the laurels that everybody understands and knows the business case to make sure that you articulate it. And so we went back to ground zero and did that. And it was definitely called upon with the ruling of the Supreme Court. And as we look to, to chart our path forward, uh, there's been no questions with our senior most executive a C-suite about articulating what the business case value is. Even in the light of that though, I'm not naive to think that there are not still challenges. And yeah. so um, so my, my uh, title as, uh, is Chief Diversity Officer. And you know there are a lot of other names or terms that have been coming into play. Uh, my question is, is there a strategic imperative in changing 
the name. Uh, and then also I'm looking at ESG and DEI. And to me, ESG is all of what DEI is, right? But coming under new terminology, that's that that that's my perspective, and I'm and I'm open to a different perspective here. But um, is that it a case in itself of finding the right opportunity to really put momentum behind ESG and to off it and to also pivot away from those words that are going to be under a microscope, uh, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And with that, I do have concerns that we would move away from really looking at the true underrepresented um, uh, uh, segments of, of society. Yeah, so um, I'll jump in here. I, I think it's very, very important that we um, not consider changing the name because there is no other word that um, facilitates representation. Agreed. And we right. need that representation, right? We need to have um, all different types of people represented. Mm -hmm. So um, I know that there's going to be pushes coming from many different directions to change a name to things that are mm -hmm. less controversial. But yeah. instead of us asking, you know, how do we get away from things that are controversial? Let's dive deeper into what makes this controversial. How mm -hmm. can we make it so that we're not triggered by hearing mm -hmm. the words that are controversial? Right. The other thing is, we also, as we're talking about this next generation and preparing for the future of the workplace and the marketplace, we do need to connect our work to ESNG and um, making it so that we're talking about the uh, environment and we're talking about um, governance because these are the things that are on people's minds. You can't just look at what's coming down from the lawmakers and from the Supreme Court and everything else because when you look at the polls, um, the polls and the, the the polls are clear. There is significant data that people want diversity. They want to, they hear that we're talking about the hottest days and we're breaking all sorts of records with the weather and the temperature and all sorts of different things. And they also want to see companies that are walking the talk, that are yep. living these things. So we can't operate as if that data is insignificant because it is significant. And again, as we're looking towards the future and establishing workplaces that are sustainable, this is something that we have to make sure that our leadership doesn't forget. Um, we, we have to begin to say, hey, you know what? Look, let me, I, I saw an article that, that said, 76% 76 76 of people want to see that their organizations are sustainable. Let's share those articles with leadership. Let's make it so that we're not just reading it amongst ourselves and being educated amongst ourselves. Let's share that information with our leaders because they need to hear that. They need to see that because they have to understand that we're not just doing this in a vacuum. And we're not doing it because it's popular. We're doing it because it's right. And we're doing it because it's sustainable. All right, so it's 2.08. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, you all can feel free to uh, connect with Amber um, or Dr. Lee or myself or Shante or Derwin or Karen or anybody um, on our team. There's a bunch of people that um, that we uh, that that we want to make ourselves available to you all. We're here to serve you. Um, certainly, uh, we we're not we're not in this because of the money. That's why we wanted to make this session free. We wanted to provide an opportunity to motivate you all, to encourage you, to keep you focused on the task at hand. Um, it is very the work that you're doing is very very important, and certainly we are changing the world. We would not be under the attack and facing as much opposition if we were not changing the world. So anyone who has as much influence as we have, um, we would not be, uh, you know, experiencing the things that we're experiencing. So don't stop. Don't stop. Don't stop. Onward and upward. Thank you, Janine. Let's go. Let's get it. Indeed.
Great. So thank you all for joining. I will send out a follow-up email with some tools and resources as promised um, by Tavis. I will also um, include the recording so you can have it for future reference. Um, if you are a member, it will be uploaded into the Resource Center um, if you would like to watch it on the Resource Center. Um, and for non-members, again, I will include it in the, um, via email. I will also include Dr. Lee's contact and um, Tavis contact if you want to follow up them if you didn't get if you didn't get any of your questions answered today. Um, but again, thank you all for joining us today. We hope you stay safe. And as Tavis said, we fight, we win. Have a great day. Thank you.